But I'm so excited that, that we get to dive into this book now because these, these books of the Bible, the New Testament books, were written for, really, for new believers. They were written to give a solid foundation, solid doctrine, solid teaching to help you in your Christian life, in your new Christian life. A lot of them are written by the Apostle Paul. This one, that book that we're going to be studying for six weeks, was written by the Apostle Paul, and they called him Apostle. He wasn't a, a, a pastor because he, he went... And he, it was like his mission. He felt it was his calling and mission from God not to go to the Jews, of which he was a Pharisee, but he was called by God to go to the, the non-Jews. Your Bible calls, a lot of your Bibles call the Gentiles. And so he went through modern-day Turkey, and, and he, what he would do is he'd go plant a church, and, and by preaching the gospel, bringing people together, raising up leaders, training leaders, appointing a pastor, and then he'd just go and do the same thing for another city in another area. A lot of your books in your New Testament were written to cities churches that happen to be in a city that's why the names of the books are city oriented like galatians was written to the church in galatia first and second corinthians was written to the church in corinth and so on and so forth some of your new testament if it has a name like a person's name it's because it was written to that pastor of that church so so like timothy timothy was a pastor and so you have first and second timothy it's the name of that name of that book what's really cool about about this um book is that that Paul, what, what happened was, after he planted the church in Galatia and raised leaders and he, and he left, he would get reports back from his churches, all his churches that he planted. They'd write him reports and say, this is what's going on. And he would write, he would write back letters or epistles, we call them, these, these New Testament letters, that, that would give them um, instruction. That what you and I need, solid doctrine, solid teaching of how to live this Christian life this Christian life. And the book of Galatians is incredible. You guys, right after planting this church, Paul, and he leaves to go do it again, some Jewish Christians came behind him and came into that church and, and started throwing things into confusion. They said, they, they end up telling these, this church, hey, you're not doing it right. You're not, you're not doing it right. I understand, like, you, you, you believe in Jesus, but in order, to really, in order to really be a Christian, in order to really belong to this Christian club, you got to, like, do more of the law. You, gotta, you, you don't understand. There was a, there's history of all this law. You need to start obeying. And it may seem a little embarrassing or weird for some of you, but there was one in particular, this one law that was huge to Jewish people. It's part of their custom, a covenant that was handed down for generations, that in the Old Testament, in order for you to be righteous and godly, you need to be circumcised. And so these Gentiles, these adults, males, many of them, most of them, if not all, were not circumcised so these jewish christians come in there and say no 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 if you want to belong to this club you need to be circumcised which which you know would be really i mean there's so much humor in the bible i i hope you guys read it for what it is it's just funny there is an actual debate in scripture do you know this acts chapter 15 records a debate of church leaders debating about this topic of should we as part of the membership covenant of our church membership class of our church include a surgery for the dudes which would have made that class females only right you know the, the honey you go you go on in there be you sign the membership for both of us i'm gonna wait in the car that's what that's what they're they're talking about here so let me give you the part the big idea of this series is how to be free that's like the, the how do i stay free they they were given this this freedom in Christ, this beautiful grace, this didn't deserve it kind of kind of freedom and salvation, and 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 now they're they're being thrown into confusion by some people coming and saying, no, 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 there's more, and you're not doing it right. So the the, the big idea really, this the Galatians is a corrective letter to the Galatian church, and and Paul is is explaining to them, teaching them, giving them doctrine to learn how to be free, how to be free. Um, so let me give you the part. That's not in your notes in chapter 1 of Galatians. We're going to dive into the scriptures, you guys. Look up here for the ones that are not. I'm going to start in verse 1. Um, it's not in your notes. It's up here. It says, Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by men, but by Jesus Christ. Most of what Paul taught and wrote was a direct revelation from Jesus. It was after Jesus r rose from the dead. So he had direct revelation from Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers and sisters with me so he traveled with an entourage of helpers and people that would go and help him plant churches to the churches in galatia 
Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And the next verse is, is a very powerful, very interesting. I believe it is the key verse of, of chapter 1, if not the entire book of Galatians. This is the key verse. So I'm, I'm going to stick right here for today. If you want to read the rest of Galatians, you can go do that. It, it, a lot of it, we're not going to get into it today because a lot of it's historical. Paul, Paul starts to talk about like how he, what his training was and what his journey was. It's good, go read it. But the, 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 the key verse of, Gal, of the book of Galatians and in chapter 1 is right here, verse 6 of Galatians 1. Paul says, I am astonished. He's saying, I'm so surprised and he's actually fed up. He's he, and he expresses a lot of frustration. You'll see throughout this letter, frustration and some attitude. I'm, I'm so astonished that you're so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ. And grace is a key word here and a theme throughout the book. I'm so surprised that the teaching I gave you, he's saying, that the, the freedom you found, you've gone right back. You're turning to a, and here's the key phrase I want you to grab hold of today. You're turning to a different gospel. Which some of you would think, like, I didn't know there was another gospel. There sure is. There's two gospels. There's, there's two ways, two approaches to God and how you are going to come to God. You've turned to a different gospel, and there's one of them, he says, which is no gospel. It's really no gospel at all. So he was really fed up with these Jewish Christians that came behind him, and literally what they did uh, is, is told them, look, you need, you need to be circumcised which would have threw, I mean, I'm telling you, it, was, it would have shocked everybody there. And he goes on and says, um, evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. And that's what I want to talk about today. Some of you have found Jesus. You have found grace. You've experienced this, this freedom, something you did not owe, but somehow you feel liberated and free and forgiven. You've you found that, and it's just human nature to go right back to not what Jesus has done for us, but what can I do to keep this? What can, what can I do now to, to keep moving forward or to grow? And it, and it, it moves away from what, what God has done for us to what I can do for myself. And it turns even the freest expression of God's grace and his love and the gospel to dead religion. In fact, years ago, this, this, is, this is such a foundational topic, not just for our personal lives, but it's, it's a foundational topic in, in that we need to, because we are, we are the best advertisements for the kingdom of heaven. Do you know that? Like Christians, you are. It's not a church. It's not a program. Like you are the brand of Jesus. Like we are, we are, I believe that Christianity has a branding problem. Because, because there's so many people that are, that because it's so easy for us who, we receive the right gospel, but we start going into, the, into a religion kind of flow, and, and then and it's, and it's a bad representation of the free grace and gospel that God has to offer to people. I was, years ago, I was in an airport, and I was eating, trying, getting, uh, about getting onto another flight, and trying to get some food in between, and there was this guy who was eating really close by to me, and, and he was drinking too, he had like, whole bunch of beers by him he was pounding them and I just like I'm gonna, I'm gonna spark up a conversation with the guy I started having a conversation and sure enough he asked me the question that usually you get asked at airports or different places holding like that and he says what do you do for a living and it's at that point that I I honestly every time I get asked I think about lying and be honest with you because because I'm either it's gonna go one of two directions it's either gonna get into like some sort of theological question and answer thing oh you're a pastor or or I'm gonna get a hater you know and it's just not gonna be fun Either way, it's kind of not fun. I'm like trying to eat here. So I'm like, okay, okay, no, no. I'm, I, so I struggle with it in my mind real quick. I'm not going to lie. And I tell him, you know, well, well I'm, I'm a pastor. And, he, and, and his demeanor and everything just changes. And, and he looks at me just disgruntled now. And he says, well, pastor, well, I don't like Christians. And, and so it, it, I'm taken back a little bit, but I, like, I, like, I want to I wanna make him get taken back a little bit. So I say, yeah, me, me too. And he's like, what? What do you mean? You're a pastor. 
you got to like Christians. I said, no, 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 I know, I know what you're talking about. I, know, I, just, I understand what you're saying because I know the Christians that you're talking about, man. And, and, and I'm just trying to, and I'm just being like half serious, okay? I'm just trying to get him to do a mindset because I know where he's coming from. I know the brand that he's been seeing, okay? And, and he's like, well, um, I don't understand. And so I said, well, and I, and I begin to tell him, like, Christianity has a branding problem. That, that there are a lot of people that have perverted this free gospel. And I, I basically start talking about this. There's a lot of people that have kind of perverted it, and they, and they make it what we call religion. They make it about religion, which is what we can do to get to God instead of what the gospel really is, is a relationship with the one God who came to us. And, and I said, and so I, I understand what you're saying, man. He said, wow, I, I don't get it. And so I, and I begin to explain to him because he's eating. He's, and, and, and I said, you know what, because God came to us, and he paid our debt, our bill. And I pointed at his food because I was thinking, like, ooh, I'm going to pay this guy's bill. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop. Man, it's, this guy's going to get saved right now. I was like, oh, I got it all figured out. Like, like God created it. And I'm like, this is it. And I'm like, he paid your bill. And I'm going to, like, get my wallet out. And he, and, and he saw me pointing at his food. He thought I was pointing out, I think, his beer or something. And so he, he looks over, and he's, he, and he's thinking, I think in his mind, he's thinking, like, like God would pay for, my, for me to get drunk here. Yeah, and, he, and he picks up the thing, and he's like, well, what, is, what does your God think about this? And he shoves the drink, like, in my face. And, and, and I told him, I said, well, I, I don't think God cares about that too much right now. I think, I think God cares more about you. And if he can get you, he'll talk to you about that later. And, and he said, well, I've never heard it like that. And I said, well, it's in the Bible. It's, the, it's there. So let me just say again how very easy for us, every single one of us, myself included, to go right back into this religion mode of what I can do instead of what, what, I, what he has done. It, it's, and this is such a foundational teaching. I try to teach on this topic every year or two. I try to come back to this because every one of us needs to be reminded because there's something within the heart of man that tries to go back that direction and you can see it all over the bible that 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 man is always gravitated toward gravitated towards religion and not towards a relationship so here's the key question jot it down if you're taking notes key question today that is how am i going to become godly how well, what's going to be my approach to getting to god what is my approach to serving god what is my approach how am i going to do it how am I going to do it? Now, by the way, this is the same question. The same applies for every religion. Do you know every religion has a pathway to get to their God? Every religion has a, this is what you got to do. Okay, this is where you're at. Now, this is what you got to do in order to get right, get to God, get to whoever, whatever. Every religion has a pathway. Here's the problem with us as followers of Christ. We try to treat Christianity and following Jesus like every other religion, the do's and don'ts and rules and regulations, and it doesn't work. That's, that is dead religion. So let me ask it this way. Are you pursuing goodness and godliness? Or are you pursuing God? Okay, now I want you to just sit on that for a moment. You're, what is the difference? Sit on that because the way you answer that question is so important. It's so vital to understand this foundational core message of our church, really. It's so core. It's so foundational to the gospel that it shows up in the first book of the Bible what we're talking about right here. It shows up in Genesis. So after, after the creation story, heaven and earth is created. Now God is interacting with man. This shows up, and I want to show it to you in Genesis chapter 2, verse 8. It says, Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east of Eden. So we're talking about the Garden of Eden here. And there he put man and that he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. Now check this out. In the middle of the garden, he made a choice. He put a choice in the middle of the garden. Now, I want to clear this up because a lot of people have this, this mindset. Most people think the Garden of Eden story, because maybe you grew up with Sunday school, you think of like Eve. You, you get a picture of Eve, and she's got all this long hair to cover all of her body parts because it's a kid's book. You know what I'm saying? You get little kids, you got to cover that stuff up. So, and she's holding an apple, and there's a bite out of the, there's like a bite taken out of the apple. Well, the, the Bible never says, it doesn't say it was an apple. And most people even think that this is a time, oh, the Garden of Eden, this was a time that, that Adam and Eve rebelled against God. They sinned 
against God and, and, and went their own way. That's not entirely true. That's not entirely true. Actually, they had a different choice that was presented to them. And this choice that I'm going to show you today was even more deadly than what you maybe think it was. The choice led to sin, but it wasn't their intention to sin. It wasn't what was dangled in front of them. So in the middle of the garden, there was the tree of life. Check this out. And the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So it was a knowledge base. It was a world view. It was a what's my approach to become godly? How am I going to approach God? How am I going to become godly? You have a choice. You can do it through the tree of life. Or you can do it through this, this you know, knowledge of good, become godly through this other tree. Now watch what he said in verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't let that be your world view. That's not, don't let that tree be your world view view that's not how you get to me for when you eat of it there's a cause you will surely die there's there's a cause I'm, and you it will kill you if you eat from this tree if you take this other gospel if you if you try to operate from this other religion mindset it will destroy your capacity to have a relationship with me that's what God is saying and not only that because you were made for this freedom you were made for grace you were made to flow this way freely with God not only will it mess up your relationship with him but it will mess up your marriage it'll mess up your kids it'll mess up every relationship you have because you're eating from the wrong tree you're operating from the wrong mode he's saying this will kill you you're gonna, you're gonna it, it, this is this is serious you will you'll die and obviously the devil doesn't want to ha us to have a right relationship with God. And so insert the devil in chapter 3. He came in the form of a serpent, and he was crafty, the Bible says, crafty than any other, more crafty than any other of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say, come on, think about it, come on. The same thing that the Jewish Christians told the, 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 to these, you know, uh, to the Galatian Christians. It came behind Paul. Did God really say that? I mean, the, are you sure you... You must not eat from the tree in the garden. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the trees in the garden. But yeah, God did say, you must not eat from the fruit, from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it or you will die. Now watch what the devil says next. He said, that's not true. No, 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 that's not the right way. You heard it wrong. And he said this, you won't surely die. For God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. Now listen to me. Listen, this is so important. The devil did not appeal to Eve's desire to sin. The devil did not appeal to Eve's desire to be rebellious. Listen, the devil appealed to Eve's desire to be godly. See, a lot, a lot of people have this wrong concept of God that you think that the devil, or the, the, the enemy, the devil, you think that the devil is all enticing you to sin, trying to trip you up, temptation, evil, addiction, bondage. He's trying to get you up. Yes, sure he is, but he is crafty, the Bible says, more crafty than that. The devil can come along and say, hey, 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 this is how you get to God. You want to get to God? You want to be godly? No, 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 that's not how you do it. That's to come eat out of this tree. You can get to God yourself. You can control your own godliness. You can be good. Wow, you can be even better than that. You won't surely die. You're going to be like God, knowing, look at it, look at it, knowing good and evil. You'll have this worldview. you have this idea where literally you think you control your own godliness. You can become better yourself by doing it yourself. And she bought into it. And so, so did Adam, and when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it, and she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. And watch what happens next verse. This is what happens every time you make the wrong choice, every time you, you eat from the wrong tree, every time you buy into the other gospel. This is what happens. The eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they both were naked. In fact, later on in the story, God says, he, he shows up to them, he says, who told you you were naked? You, you, who told you you were naked? You were never supposed to know you were naked. I, I created you free. 
I created you without that, that knowledge worldview. I created you to be free in your relationship with me. You were never supposed to know you were naked. Look what happens every time we eat from the wrong tree, we choose the wrong gospel, loss of innocence and shame. Loss of innocence and shame. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And this basic foundational story is so critical for you to know. And I know it's a little bit deeper. Go on this journey with me in this study. We don't do this all the time, but, we, but, but I'm telling you, God has something for you in this story and in this truth that's so foundational to your relationship with him. To make sure you understand it, I want to say it in three different ways. I've got three different points to contrast the differences of these two gospels, of these two trees, to maybe even see what tree you've been eating out of lately. Here, let me give them to you this way. One of these gospels, one focuses on what you do. That's, that's, that's one focus on what, on what you do. In fact, it's all about you, and you're thinking all about what you do. So let me give you an illustration of this. You don't read your Bible because you love your Bible. You read your Bible because you've got to get five chapters in. And you're thinking about the chapters you read. So I used to read five a day, and now I'm eight a day. And man, and those people that don't read as much as I read, they don't just got the relationship with God like I got a relationship with God. They're never, it's never supposed to be. It was never supposed to be that focus on what you do or what you don't do. The focus should be on what Jesus has done. That's the real gospel. So we're not thinking about how long did I pray. Did I get enough? How, how many chapters did I read and, and ever be around? I don't know if you've ever been around places where people will size you up in a minute spiritually. Well, they'll, they'll just look at you and just look down on you. And, 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 and I'm, I'm telling you with that they're, and it's always based on what they're good at. So, so if they're morning prayer people, they'll, they'll look. Oh, you're morning, you don't pray in the morning. You just, you, you're just not starting off your day with the armor of God. You, you're a weak Christian if you don't pay, pray in the morning. And so they, they, it's always on what they're good at, right? They always measure everybody else on what they're good at. It's always focusing on what they do and not what Jesus has done. That's the other gospel. That's religion, you guys. One focuses on what you do and one focuses on what Jesus has done. And they are always focused on what they do and so, so let me put it this way. If I'm reading my Bible, I'm not focused how, so much on how much I read. I'm focuses, focused on how much of Jesus I find in what I read. And whether it takes me ten chapters or two chapters or one verse, my goal is to, I want to find you in here, Jesus. I want to draw closer to you, Jesus. It doesn't matter about the amount. I just want to come in closer into this relationship with you. That was always supposed to be the focus. That was supposed to be the focus, you guys. I want to get closer to you. Some people think they have the corner on the market on God because they got this biblical understanding, and I've taken theology this, and I've read this, and does, and 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 that was, that's not the way it's supposed to be. Stop that. That's not that's not the reason behind your study. You want to see it in Scripture? Jesus said in John chapter five, verse thirty-nine. Jesus said, "You diligently study the Scriptures because you think you're so smart." And you, you think that your smartness and well, it's the amount of how smart you are will give you eternal life. Not true, Jesus says. These, these are the scriptures that testify about me. You weren't supposed to just read a bunch and memorize a bunch. And, 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 and I'm telling you, it's good too. Don't get me wrong. Don't twist what I'm saying. It's good to read. Read your word. Memorize it. Study your word. But the focus is not to accomplish that. It's not an end in and of itself. The end is always closer to Jesus. That's the end. One that focuses on what, on what Jesus has done in a relationship with him, not on what you are doing or not doing. The scriptures testify about me, but you refuse to come to me to have, and here's that word, to have life. 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 You can have the tree of life. You can eat from this thing. But man, the way you're reading the scriptures, the way you're pursuing me, you're eating from the wrong tree. You're eating from the wrong tree. The word life keeps showing up all throughout your Bible. Let me give you another explanation of the difference of these gospels, and that is one focuses on getting God's approval. One focuses on getting God's approval. Like I got to, I got to earn 
God's, you know, approval and favor, maybe even earn his love. I don't know. It might be because the way that your parents, the way treated you and the way you need to earn their love or their affirmation, or maybe it's just because you grew up in a religious mindset where that was the case and, and even, neither of those are the case. There's just something within our hearts. There was a Gallup poll that came out several years ago that said that Americans have this view of God that he's mad at them, that, that God's an angry, like he's angry. And my first, my first pastoral, like true pastoral position I ever had, I, I, I got in my, my, my office and my, in, in, my, in my desk, and, and inside of my desk drawer, I found a whole bunch of stuff. There's a, <laughs> there a whole bunch of stuff, man, I probably shouldn't have seen. But one of them was a track. You remember, remember Bible tracks? Remember Bible tracks back in the day? There was a Bible track, but this was a really old one. And it pictured what, what I think a lot of us have a, the picture of God. I picture God like in this Abraham Lincoln memorial chair. Like this huge, like, and he's this faceless, shining God. And there's these ants, like humans. And, and, and it's like the people have this view of God that he's, he's looking at you like, like, what are you doing now? What are you doing now? Can't you just get it right? And you don't have the right view of God. Like, like you know, that's not, that is, that is not what God looks like. That's not my God. I believe if you have the right picture of God in your mind, that he's not all mad at you. The Bible actually says in Psalm t- chapter 2, that the God who sits in throne, who sits in heaven, laughs. Do you know that? Like, like the right picture of God is God is going, <laughs> man, I love you so much. He's just laughing over you. You don't have to. Look, you don't have to win God's approval. You know why? Because here's the truth. Here it is. Here's the focus. God already loves you. God already loves loves you you need to focus on receiving the love that already exists it's there in fact let me say it this way god knows your sin life and he still loves you he still loves you now he doesn't like what you did please don't confuse that god doesn't like the sin that you did but that doesn't change his heart and love towards you god loves you he is in love with you and when you understand that Are you ready for this? When you understand that, that changes everything about how you relate to God. Let me say it this way. Your view of God will determine your relationship with God. The way you view God will determine how you you interact in your relationship with God. And so if you think God is all upset at you, here's how it plays out. You came into church this morning, and you know what you did. You know God knows what you did. And so during worship, you're... You're thinking to yourself, well, I can't really go all in and worship and sing too loud or lift my hands too high because God knows what I did. God knows I wouldn't want to be a hypocrite. And so everything within you is like, is like compelled to love God and you want to worship Him and you want to burst out and you want to cry out and draw closer to Him, but you talk yourself out of it because you think God's mad at you and He's not mad at you. You're eating from the wrong tree. That's a different gospel. That's a different God altogether. It's really not even a gospel. The, Paul is saying, God is not mad at you. He's madly in love with you. And what you do or what you don't do does not determine in God's love for you. Amen, Pastor. Hallelujah. Amen. Okay, Romans chapter 5 says it this way. This is a lot better than you're responding right now, you guys. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love for this. How? How does he do it? While I was still sinning. While I was still an idiot. While I was still messing up. While I was still making the wrong choices. Christ died for us. You don't need to change for God to start loving you. He loved you so you can change. You don't need to get your act together so God will love you. God wants to love you so he can get your act together. Yes, the, it, the, the order is very important in your relationship with God. You get to God so you can get your act together. He, wa- he, wants to, he wants you to come to Him as close as you can and love Him as much as you can, and it's there that you don't get condemnation. You get a conviction of the Holy Spirit, absolutely. So even, even though you did something last week, you can run to Him in worship, and I'm telling you, it will change everything in your relationship with God. I love this verse. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19 says, We love because He first loved us in other words whatever we do the reason why i worship is because when i am still being an idiot when i'm still when i'm still like 
he still loved me. And one of my personal pet peeves is like when people turn like serving God and, and, and this relationship with God into some sort of sacrifice that it's like, oh, it's like I got to just uh, serve in the Lord, you know, and like I got to oh, come, I come early to serve in the house of God, you know, I guess. And they make it like it's, a, it's like a burden or something. You're eating out of the wrong tree. That is, I'm telling you, this is the most joyful experience to serve my God. I'm telling you, in the tree of life, when you're serving in a relationship with God, it is a joy. It is not a burden, you guys, at all. It's not a burden. We love, I mean, I love him. I love it because he first loved us. I want that for you as well. Here's the last one. One focuses on external duty. One focuses on external duty. Do it, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. You didn't pray enough. You didn't read your Bible enough. You need to do more. You need to do it. You need to do it better. Do it better. That's not enough. Well, I didn't want to. Okay, I didn't want to, but okay, God, I'll do it anyway. Do it anyway. I guess, I, okay, 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 God, you, you twisted my arm. Okay. But the other one focuses on an internal desire. It, it's the joy of my life, like I was saying in this last one. I don't... I, it moves from have to, this is how we say it around here at Discovery, it moves from have to to get to. It's, it's the joy of my life. Let me show you in your Bible. First John chapter 5 says, this is love for God. Let me say it this way. This is how you love God. And that is obey his commands. Aha, see, Pastor, I told you. I told you. No, 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 check it out. Watch what the next line says. And his commands are not burdensome. Oh, yes, they are. Let me tell you something. Yes, absolutely they are if you're not in love with Jesus. If you're not in love with Jesus, this thing, this Bible will be the hardest thing you will ever try to do in your life. But when you are in love with Jesus, it is the joy of your life to do anything and everything written in that book. You see, I don't, I, I don't, I don't get up in the morning in my... And, th and think, you know, okay, Jason, one more day. Don't you go commit adultery on Veronica. Don't you, don't you do it today, Jason. Don't, don't be looking at it. Don't be, don't, no, no, slap my hand, slap my eyes. And, okay, okay, I think I can do it one more day. No, no, no. Why? You know why? Because I'm in love with my wife. I love Veronica. Like, I love her, and she's, and I, I'm not looking. I don't need to spank my hand, spank my eyes. It's like I am in love with my wife, and that love protects me. It guards me. One focuses on the, the external duty, and the other focuses on the internal desire. His commands are not burdensome. He who has the Son and has this love relationship has, say that word out loud, he has the Son, has life. And he who does not have the Son does not have life. It's a pain to do it, but it's a pain. So how? how let, let's close with this. Well, then how can we eat from the right tree? How can we make sure that, that like we're living in that tree, that although the propensity, the tendency for the human heart is to go back to this religion flow, the, the focusing on what we do or not do, and, and how can we make sure we're continuing to eat from the right tree? How can we be free? How can we be free? Let me give you three things on how you can live in the tree of life. Write them down. Number one, fall in love with Jesus. Fall in love with Jesus. So how do you do that? Someone once, they, they told me, I was talking about loving God and falling in love with him. At one, after the service, a guy asked me one time, he said, Pastor, you make it sound so easy. How do I do that? How do I fall in love with Jesus? Let me give you how I. There's two like reasons why. I love Jesus. It's because of what, who he is and what he's done for me. It draws me in. Who he is. When I have the right vision, the right picture of God, when I don't think he's mad at me, he's, he's grumbling at me, when I have the right picture of the God who laughs over me, who loves me unconditionally, it compels me to him, not away from him. When I know who he is, and when I think about what he's done, that he paid the debt that he did not owe, I owed it, that I had a consequence of my sin and my choices, and because of his love and his grace, he wiped it out, now he's given me things I don't deserve. 
a freedom and a life and a future and eternity I did not deserve. When I think about who he is and what he's done, I fall in love with him all over again. Fall in love with Jesus. And there's a beautiful verse right here in in the book of John. Jesus speaking again here. 14, verse 15. If you love me, comma, if you love me, comma, you will obey what I command. Okay, some people... <clears throat> some, some people read that verse out of the wrong tree. Okay, this is, this is how we read it out of the wrong tree, in, in the tree of uh, the other gospel. Okay? You, you think that God is, is saying, like through this verse, he's looking at Jason, going, Jason, Jason, now make sure that you obey. And you treat your wife right, and you do right, and, and do this, and don't do this, and do that, and, and, and don't even try to tell me, Jason, you love me if you are not doing this, this and this. I don't even want to hear it. You, 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 if you love me, you obey. That's the wrong tree. Let me tell you what the right tree is. Let me tell you. If you love me, you will. You will. If you just love, if you just love me, you will. My love will do something inside of you that you can't do yourself. If you love me, you will. Let me ask you, what side of the comma do you find yourself on today? And what tree? Do you, do you find yourself kind of, I need to obey, to love God, to get his love? The order is so important here. The, the order is important. That's the wrong tree. The right tree is I love him. I know I'm messed up. He knows I'm messed up. That's what makes me love him more. And you know what? As I, as I kind of pursue that more and pursue that more, the will works in ways I don't, I don't even understand. But God changed the will. He changed my will. He changed my want to. And wow, I, what side of the comma, what, in what tree do you find yourself? So here's, here's the second thing to understand. If you want to live in the tree of life, be careful of this word here, condemnation. Don't allow condemnation. In fact, don't allow it in your relationships. Don't allow it in your life. Don't, don't allow it because as soon as I finish this message, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you a little heads up right now, a little warning. As soon as I finish this message, the devil is waiting for you out there, and he's working overtime. And he will do exactly what he did in the garden in a very crafty way. I mean, he's not going to tempt you, some of you, with sin and addiction and all the. He's going to tempt you with this religion thing that he's been doing from the very beginning. Oh, you want to, you, no, that's not how it is. You've got to, you need to, you better. And he'll go condemn you right when you get out of here. He'll start, he'll start condemning you. And j- this is exactly what the Jewish Christians did to the Galatian church. Uh-uh, that's not how it works. No, no, no. And don't ever expect him to stop. He'll never stop doing that, by the way. There will always be that, that struggle inside of us to eat from either the tree of life or this tree of a, of a different world view that God does not want us operating and flowing from. He'll come along and say, you're not doing enough. You're not do-. And that's, that's exactly when you don't need to start doing more. Listen, that's when you need to draw deeper into a relationship with God. That's when you need to go deeper into your relationship with him. And by the way, this condemnation thing, it's not just towards you. It's towards other people too. Don't don't allow it. Don't allow not only the enemy to bring condemnation to you, but don't allow the enemy to use you as an accuser of condemnation. One of the best ways you know whether you're eating out of the wrong tree is the way you view other people. As soon as you start measuring other people up, I can't believe they allow that kind of person to serve here. (laughs) Look. (laughs) (laughs) Why? How come? Look, you can't even judge somebody else unless you're eating from the wrong tree. You can't do it. The The moment you start operating in that flow, you're in the wrong gospel. You're in the wrong tree. Look what the Bible says, Romans chapter 8. Therefore, there is now no condemnation. Look, that is not only for you, but every other sinner just like you that's sitting in your row and around you. There is no condemnation. None. 
for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, that law, that religion, the, the law of the Spirit who gives, here's that word again, it keeps showing up all over your Bible, the law, of, the law of the Spirit who gives life, the tree of life. That's what the Spirit gives, life. Has set you free from the dead religion. Has set you free from the law of sin and death. This is powerful. This is so important. This is so foundational. Because this is a reality, you guys. Because the enemy will keep coming back. And here's the key. This is, let me close with this point. Because it's going to happen over and over and over again. There's always going to be a pull, no matter how long you've been serving God, how long you've been in church. This is going to be constant. That's why I want to end with this point. Number three, make the choice every day. Make the choice every day to eat from the tree of life. Make the choice to live free and in relationship to God, to be grace-centered, not, not duty-centered, not have to, not performance-based, not trying to get approval. Make the choice every day to be grace-centered, free, and pursuing not godliness, not even goodness, but pursuing God in a relationship. Make the choice every day. So here's your invitation. Last scripture, and if you could just look up here for this last one. Don't, don't look at your notes for this one because this is going to be the invitation. This is the invitation today. It's right up here on, on, on the screen. Deuteronomy chapter 30. This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you, that I have set before you as your pastor, and, in, and even more importantly, as uh, the word of God has set before you a choice. Tree of life that other gospel that brings death. Life and death. Blessings. See, one of them will bring blessing on your life. That relationship will bring blessing on your life. That religion, that other tree, brings curses. And I love how it ends. Now, now choose. Come on. It, it, he sets before the choice in the middle of that garden. Now choose. 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 Here, choose. Life, choose freedom, choose grace, choose a relationship with Jesus Christ. Hey, with that, everyone all across the room, let's bow our heads. That's our invitation today. With every head bowed and eye closed, that's the invitation today. Choose life.